that it wouldn't last because of tremendous temperatures on these high RPMs that are necessary to be able to achieve these speeds. Yeah, so again, for the sake of our EAA video, we are simulating what has to be so fast, that's the aerodynamic side of the, of the uh, project. The other film is how it's made, and we'd like to show you some little pieces of that. As I mentioned, the airplane is made in the same way that the AMSOIL, I'm sorry, that the Rutan designed uh, very easies and long easies are made. That is, uh, basically we're carving the airplane out of foam and fiberglassing and then finishing that off. So. Uh, the only thing unique about my airplane is that I used the same hot wire um, techniques that are used primarily on wings in uh, rutan design airplanes. That is, uh, we stretch a, a hot wire between two metal templates on each end of a block of foam and carve out that airfoil shape. Uh, works very well for wings, but nobody's used it on fuselages until uh, we tried it on this airplane. It works very well. So the sandwiches that comprise the, the uh, 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 primary structure on the fuselages are all uh, about 0.4 inches thick uh, with fiberglass on both sides. And just to bring you up to speed on that, we're going to show you a little piece. Are you ready, Max? Mm -hmm. This is how the sandwich is made, and then we'll go ahead and show you how the fuselage is put together. Are these tapes commercially available? They're available at Aircraft Spruce and Specialty Company and Wix. As a matter of fact, we'll be over there hawking them. We'd love to sell you one. Okay. Have you got any uh, micro for us? We're not going to make you sit through that layup. <laughs> uh, Max, if you'll roll up to that next one. <laughs> um, any questions so far? Sir? The upper side, yes, that's an in, incomplete segment there. The upper side was glass first when it was part of the thick uh, foam block. And what we were showing you there is just how we went, we, we uh, put another template uh, just below it, which would give us the 0.4 inches, cut it off, turn it over and glass it. The wood that you saw was just a, um, a fixture to temporarily hold it so it wouldn't twist before we got that second piece of uh, fiberglass on. Yes, sir. It's, uh, it's all straight lines, which I think is what you're asking. Um, that's part of the, you saw the first part where we decided to make the fuselage sides straight back from the, uh, basically it's straight from the cowl, uh, the firewall back to the, behind the cockpit or to the trailing edge of the wing. It makes a little compound curve there, which we have to carve freehand. And then from that point on, the tail cone is, is all straight lines. Sir. The, the adventure, yes, I was very inspired by that. Nice, nice little airplane. Oh, did he? Okay, well, I'm just about ready to make a claim that uh, nobody's done it before me. You embarrass me now. <laughs> Any more questions? Sir? Uh, did, did you take carry on from some uh, NAC a uh, report on that interference study that you did? Uh, can you cite uh, some, uh, some no, uh, the only thing, uh, my my information came from Horner, H-O-E-R-N-E-R, -E yeah. Uh, but uh, that's the only place you would find, uh, find that Well, I think there are uh, many people in the audience here who know very well that there are uh, many references that sort of give that, but I don't know what they are, yeah, other than that. Problem, which came, I believe it or not, is a fortune for me to write you to talk about this, because on the way here, I was thinking of how I could use the interference as a substitute for runner control. Mm -hmm. Interesting notion. Any other questions? Sir? You said that the airplane, because the way it was built, was kind of heavy. How much lighter could you make if you made it a different way? Uh, you know, um, in 1978, I was here. <clears throat> this is the, the, the first time I'm in Oshkosh since 1978. I was in, I think, this very tent 
uh, when Bert Rutan introduced uh, one of his airplanes and said, I think he said about the very easy that he figured it would be, the airframe alone would be 16% lighter if he had made it out of metal. So, and most of that added weight is the weight of the filler and the paint that you need to fill in all that, uh, the weave on the outside of the fiberglass. Sir? Before you let a fighter plane, what uh, fuel capacity did you have on board? It has 12 gallons. And, and on the record flight, how many gallons did you, did you use? We took off with a half a tank, but that was primarily because we were about 20 minutes from the from the course, or the, the airport that we were flying off was 20 minutes from the course, so we had a commute. Uh, back and forth from the record, of course. And what fuel rate do you think you used when you were making the run? Well, I can only tell you what the Rotax manual says at full throttle, it's uh, up around seven gallons. We used, um, I think, about four gallons to make, uh, to commute to the course, to make the four passes that the FAI requires and to get back on the ground. Gee, I can't, I don't remember. It's probably 45 minutes. And then when you're in your fighter plane mode, what range can you get in your plane? About 500 miles is the range. Just about uh, like an Emmy 109. That's my... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? We'll get... Sir, in the back. Is the AR-5 on the convention site? The AR-5 has had an accident. Um, we had an engine failure uh, last, late last year and put the airplane down in some very rough territory and took the gear off of it. It put it up on its nose and, and messed up the cowl and broke the propeller and so on. So the airplane is back in the shop now in, in, uh, in California. Uh, what we intend to do is to make some little modifications to, to uh, sort of a, tweak it up a little bit, get it to handle just right. Our, our view, our... Uh, Intent is to get some um, some people to fly the airplane next year and do some pilot reports. Uh, it's, I'm the only person who's flown the airplane so far, and I claim that it handles beautifully. But that's just my word. Uh, we'd like to have some people fly it who will write a little article, perhaps, and, and publish it so all of us can can, uh, can know how it flies. There, there are no doubt, and there are no places we can see pictures. Uh, you can see pictures of it in the current or uh, the most recent issue of Sport Aviation Magazine, which you can find here on the convention site. And the aircraft spruce boom. Oh, yeah, there are some photographs uh, that we have at the aircraft spruce booth. So if you come by there, you'll see them. Thank you. Sir. With respect to the engine that you're using, you've got Rotex 582, I believe. Are you having the same kind of failure mode every time, or are you thinking about re engineering? We've had, um, uh, I've had two engines in the airplane, a 532, which stopped uh, after about 35 hours, and that problem was caused by my having taken the engine apart and to, to inspect it after 30 hours or so. Uh, when I put it back together, apparently I cracked uh, one of the Dykes rings on the top. I didn't use a ring compressor. I'm not a real engine guy, so, um, and I flew it for another four hours and ate that ring. Uh, the second engine we put in was the 582, and it stopped uh, after also 35 hours, and it stopped because I pulled a little ferrule that was soldered on the end of one of the throttle cables off uh, when I pulled full throttle, and it ingested it, went into the rotary valve, and tore the engine up. So my feeling about the two strokes, uh, specifically the Rotax, is that they're reliable engines, but the ancillary, the auxiliary stuff, um, the hookups and so forth fail. And it's not Rotax's fault. I think we don't know how to install the engines yet. So I'm getting smarter about it. I've, I've figured out how to not have the, the ferrules come off the end of the throttle cables. But if I have to do this, uh, this learning curve for every one of these failures, it's going to be a long time before I have a reliable airplane. But 35 hours uh, trouble-free. Uh, uh, aside from that little problem, yes, sir. How about a molar rotary? Uh, molar, I don't know really what he's doing. Uh, he has the rights to the OMC um, uh, rotary engine, and I, 
I don't want to get into an engine development program. Uh, that's why I stuck with the Rotax. Yes, sir. No plans are available for the airplane because of the liability problem. Well, two, two reasons, really. First, it's a lightweight single-seater, so it has a relatively small market, low profit potential, and high liability risk. So we've decided that it's just not, not worth the, the risk. Any other questions? Okay, we're going to show you a little bit of the just how the, the fuselage is put together. Max? Uh, that pretty much covers the stuff that I'll need to tell you. If, uh, if there are other um, questions, we can go ahead with those. Let me just say that our intent is to put the airplane back together with the 582 Rotax. That engine was stock, absolutely stock, the first time we ran it. Um, but we uh, had to modify the exhaust system on the airplane, and we think we're probably getting a little less horsepower than the, than the full rated horsepower of 65 just to make sure next time so that we can give uh, the aerodynamicists some accurate numbers on horsepower so they can really do some, some accurate work. Um, we're going to put the engine back together at a racing shop uh, in Berkeley, California that has a dynamo. So the, our first, uh, what we're going to do is uh, put the engine on the dynamo when we, get it, um, when we get the new engine with the stock exhaust system and then we're going to try it with our exhaust system so we get an, an idea of um, what it's doing. We are not going to attempt to, to get any more horsepower out of the engine. My, I mentioned before that I'm not an engine man. I'm not interested in showing people um, what, how much horsepower I can get out of a 582 Rotax. I want to show people how much speed I can get out of 65 horsepower. So, um, Any more questions? Sir? The, the, the question is about spinners. Uh, in the article that I wrote in January, I showed a picture of the airplane as it was designed, which had a, when it had a very large spinner, it looked uh, something like a Sea Fury. It had a very small inlet opening around the spinner, which was the only uh, inlet for cooling air. Um, we, we ran the spinner and had some problems keeping the spinner on the airplane because of the Rotax's rocking couple, the two cylinders, uh, just pounded the spinner bulkheads to death. So, uh, but it cooled fine. It, it went, uh, seemed to go fast, uh, uh, but because we had problems keeping the spinner on the airplane one afternoon, we flew it without the spinner, and we're very surprised to find that it didn't go any faster at all with the spinner. Uh, so the spinner wasn't helping us in terms of speed. It was giving us a headache in terms of maintenance. And furthermore, I couldn't get inside to, to uh, to pre-flight the engine without taking the cowl off. So as soon as I realized that I could fly the airplane without the spinner, it went just as fast, uh, we forgot about the spinner. So now I pre-flight uh, just by looking in the big hole up there. Bruce has done uh, some very interesting work, or has been associated with some very interesting work with the Navy on torpedoes. Bruce, am I misquoting you? Okay. And what they discovered, which is, uh, it's not the first time it's been discovered, that, that, that um, I should really let Bruce <laughs> do this. Uh, the, the uh, stagnation point, uh, or the air that dams up in front of, uh, of a flat nose like that, tends to form its own uh, fairing. Uh, basically makes a shape that looks, uh, that allows the air to flow just as if there were a big round leading edge up there. So these guys who've been uh, putting uh, radial engines in airplanes and not putting big spinners on them really do know what they're doing. Uh, sir, yes, Bruce. Not quite right, uh, it's uh. the part of it that is a flat face. Uh, transfer from that to the parallel part Yes, uh, what Bruce is saying is that as long as the, uh, you, you can put a flat nose on a streamlined body, as long as you fare the edges, you fare the corners back, uh, uh, like, for example, you would see on a NACA cowl, a NACA radial engine cowl, that very nice uh, 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 developed curve back from the, from the flat face, 
As long as you do that, I believe I'm, let me see if I'm saying this right, there's no difference in drag so long as the wetted area remains the same. That is, if the, the difference between a, a round or a round nose on a streamlined body as compared to a flat nose, as long as the corners are rounded, uh, there's no difference in drag so long as the wetted areas are the same. Is that correct? It's a very interesting thing here. Bruce should elaborate a little bit. During World War II, they had problems launching torpedoes from airplanes uh, with uh, rounded noses on them because when they pierced the water, they, it would put a moment on it to come back up and get the airplane. So they found they could cure this if they had a flat face on, on the nose of the torpedo. And as long as the diameter of the flat part of the face uh, um, was, say, 50%, of the maximum diameter of the cylindrical part of the torpedo, and provided he had an elliptical shape between the flat face and the parallel maximum diameter section of the torpedo, with a ratio, of, I remember, of about um, twi at least twice the height of that elliptical half ellipse uh, in length, bearing into the cylindrical part of the torpedo. Then when they measured the drag of it and reduced it to a wetted area coefficient that we were talking about before, and compared it to a torpedo with a, an elliptical, a fully paired elliptical nose with the same wetted area, and they, they got no penalty in drag, or at least no appreciable penalty in drag. So that's what, um, what Mike has done with the nose of his airplane, strung it, which was absolutely horrified when he said, the thing has not only got the propeller on the front end, but it's got this big hole in the front end. He's <laughs> And uh, actually, Mike did it cleverly enough that it didn't cost him a lot to drag. Uh, that's, it's not cleverness when you're lucky. It's, <laughs> it's <laughs> Any other questions? I want to tell him one more clever. Mike, Mike asked me when I was up there, you know, could, could we make it go even faster? What would we do? So I did a few studies. One study I did was I said, for an airplane of this size and weight, and for the stalling speed that he has on his airplane, I looked at all the airfoils that I had data in the right Reynolds number range to get the same stalling speed. And I did it for two cases. One was with no flaps, and one was with full span flaps, because he was part way in between with partial span flaps. And of all the airfoils, <laughs> turned out the two he chose were optimum, gave the lowest drag area, that is the drag coefficients that we got for him, times the area of the wing, to get the same stalling speed, came up with the lowest drag area. So I said, what's this nonsense you're handing me that you aren't an engineer, and you didn't do all of these detailed optimization studies? And it, it comes from, he's just got a lot of enthusiasm, and he's patient, and he goes through all of the books, and the ones that don't really tell the story, sets aside, and he takes the good ones, and he really milks them dry. And then he went out, of course, and got the building experience. And he was in a, a shop that um, tuned up high-performance sailplanes for the sailplane racers, and he saw there all of the finest engineering for drag reduction from Europe on these very high-performance sailplanes. And he stored all of that away. It's fun to have Bruce here. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Sir. What airfoil did you use? Uh, the root section is a 65 uh, 418, very thick. Uh, the tip is a 65 215. Uh, which, if you think about that a little bit, I did it backwards for most people. I reduced the camber at the tip. And uh, Bruce and I haven't talked about this very much. Um, I, uh, in my chasing my tail, picking the airfoils and trying to design that wing, discovered that uh, if I tried to wash out uh, the wing to reduce the tendency of the wing to stall at the tips, which is very common, uh, the, the tips fell out of the drag bucket. Uh, the underside of the airfoil would uh, get turbulent or at least that's what the section characteristics that I was looking at uh, showed me. So uh, through a long process, a uh, very confusing, uh, at least confusing to me process, I finally wound up choosing that, uh, choosing to reduce the, 
the chamber at the tips. The result of all of that is that the, air, that the airplane will, in a stall, drop a wing. It, uh, I get good aileron control right up to the stall, and uh, so far as I know, it's a little bit into the stall, I'm still, I still have ailerons, but it appears to be breaking, the stall appears to be breaking um, all at once, which means that uh, sometimes it drops a wing, sometimes it drops a nose. Uh, it's a tapered platform. Any other questions? Sir? You're talking about how you're going to do a little more optimization. Um, the changes that I'm making are in uh, uh, control linkage um, uh, ratios, and I'm also shielding the horn balances. The the tail, the rudder, and the elevators are both horn balanced, uh, not because I want to reduce uh, the the control pressure, but mainly because I'm looking for a place to put the mass uh, balance uh, and. Uh, I um, had, a, had a problem in turbulence with the airplane um, sort of sashaying like a beach craft, like a V-tail bonanza in turbulence, and it got uncomfortable. It, the yaw stability is good, but uh, uh, there's something that happens with an unshielded horn balance in, in combination with some fairly stretchy rudder, rudder cables that makes it feel like it has a little Dutch roll. So I'm doing minor little things like that, shielding horn balances, changing uh, uh, stick ratios, and so forth. But no, nothing, nothing really to make the airplane go any faster. As a matter of fact, shielding the horn balances is probably going to make it go a little bit slower. Way in the back. What's the uh, stall speed and the empty weight? The empty weight is 488 pounds. The stall speed is 53 with full flaps. Bruce? Uh, the, air, the cooling system on the airplane has uses two um, radiators that I got off a 250 Honda motorcycle about six months before Rotax came out with the same radiators. They're Japanese Toyo radiators. The the um, great big hole in the front is a plenum, or, or at least provides a, a air to the plenum, which is the entire cowl. At the very aft side of the cowl, there are uh, are these two radiators, and they are ducted out through the through vents at the side of the fuselage. Sir, would you describe the spar for me? The spar, the wing is uh, essentially the same as a long, easy wing. It's a C-section spar. Uh, all fiberglass, uh, unidirectional cap strips, and uh, bidirectional web, and a solid, basically a solid foam core wing. Although I'm saying basically, it's actually got a hollow leading edge so that I can run uh, control runs and, and hydraulics. Uh, any other questions? Um, I didn't use graphite because I, I may be wrong on this, but it was my feeling that if the, if the thermal coefficients were different, that is, if I introduced another uh, variable in that, that I was going to that I was going to see the spar print through uh, on the upper skin. Uh, I don't have any real reason. I don't have any backup for that. It was just my hunch, and the. The weight savings that I would get, I also did a little calculating on it, the weight savings that I would get with a graphite spar were hardly worth the, the uh, time and money. It's very, I think the spar caps weigh a total of about four pounds in the airplane, so I might be able to save a couple of pounds. Questions? In your, yes, sir. How much in the weight? It's washed out three quarters of a degree. The wing is washed out three quarters of a degree at the tips. Bruce? Tell them about your fail-safe landing here. Oh, I'm most proud of uh, the, what happened when I, when I, uh, <coughs> we show the results of the crash that I described in the, in the second videotape. Um, what I tried to do is, uh, when the engine quit, I was very low over, the, over a lake called Barry S in Northern California, about 400 feet off the water, very foolishly uh, uh, doing a high-speed pass down that lake. The engine quit. I uh, got up to maybe 800 feet or so and managed to make it to the, to the only shore on that lake that had what appeared to be a smooth enough area to land on. 
And uh, just as at the time I was about to flare out to make the landing on this shore, I realized that I was going to flare and touch down in a ditch. So I tried to bounce on the near side of the ditch, bounce over the ditch, and, and uh, hopefully was going to make it. I didn't quite do it. About a foot and a half below the top of the rise, the main gear hit, and it folded the main gear back about 30 degrees, broke both axles off, twisted up the scissors, and, and messed it up. Um, but the result of all of that was that it didn't, the gear failed, but the wing, uh, it, the, the gear is attached to the, to the front face of the main spark. Uh, there was no damage inside the wing at all. So I'm, uh, and the reason that happened is that I made sure that the landing gear could only do, could only deliver um, a, a lesser, per, uh, could only deliver enough, uh, um, I'm getting, get myself. So the landing gear is weaker than the attachment at the wing. That's what it was, about 15% weaker. And it worked just great. So I don't have to get back in the wing and try to repair the wing. All I have to do is, uh, is and the landing gear itself is a steel tube, a uh, round steel tube with a fiberglass fairing over it. So just replace that old nasty metal and I'm back in business. We composite guys call metal nasty, doesn't it? Any other questions? Well, uh, we're uh, about five minutes away from having to get out of here anyway. I sure thank all you folks for coming. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, come by and say hello to us at the Aircraft Spruce and Specialty Company of Thank you. Thank you.